Hey there, it's Jason Stahl with another episode of Under the Radar, and I am very pleased today to have a very special guest on the program, Chris Chesney, who is the Vice President of Training and Organizational Development for Repairify. Welcome, Chris. Hi, Jason. How are you? I'm very good. How are you? Excellent. Excellent. So I want to start off with Chris. Uh, a couple of years ago at SEMA, the 2021 SEMA show, I visited your booth and I was talking to one of your people and he said, you know, the goal of Repairify was to become a one-stop shop for calibrations and diagnostics and remote programming. Um, I, and I know you guys have been making a lot of acquisitions over the last several years, I guess, to become that one-stop shop. Do you feel that, that, that today, as it stands, Repairify has become that one-stop shop? Well, I, bl I believe I remember that day well because that was the day they announced that I was coming on board at uh, SEMA 2021. Um, and as any technology company wants to, to promote, uh, all of us want to become a one-stop shop. Uh, but that needle moves all the time. So are we there yet? No. Do we have a roadmap to get to that point where a shop can access remote services that fills the gaps that they have in their organization? Yes. Uh, we have acquired a lot of organizations over the last two and a half years. Uh, when I came on board a year and a half ago, uh, it was they were right in the middle of that and still in the process of, of acquiring two or three more organizations after I started. And we recently have kind of paused and said, okay, we've got all these technologies. Here's what we bought them for. Here's the assets that we, we now have. And we uh, kind of rethought our organization slightly so that we can get uh, the synergies in place and the efficiencies in place that we need to bring all the technologies that we had envisioned at that time uh, to market. And that's what we're in the process of doing today. Is there one acquisition that stands out to you as being particularly significant? Well, I, you know, I don't know that there's one. Each one of them is unique in not only the products and services that they provided at that point in time uh, when we acquired them, but uh, really it's the talent uh, and the uh, human capital that we gained from each of those organizations along with uh, those services and products, many of which we have morphed into or uh, consumed into some of our core business. I would probably say the, the most significant acquisition by Repairify and, and our uh, holding company, uh, uh, Kinderhook is Aztec and the core business of Aztec really is the foundation that we continue to build upon. But then you take uh, acquisitions like Blue Driver where we brought in their technologists and uh, put them together with our engineers at Aztec uh, to create some new technologies that are on the forefront of being launched uh, that will significantly change the way shops approach uh, servicing their vehicles and bridging gaps in technology and skill uh, that they haven't had access to before uh, that will hopefully separate us and create a significant competitive advantage for Repairify. Let's talk about that for a minute, Chris. You mentioned some names there and it's a little bit confusing, I think, to some people. You mentioned the holding company is Kinderhook. And I think in your original ideation, it was Aztec, and then that became Repairify. Talk to me about the, all the brands you have and, the again, the holding company above you, and then list out all the brands. Okay, so Kinderhook is a private equity group that uh, uh, is our principal investor and uh, owner. Repairify is the brand that is an umbrella brand that covers all of the brands within the organization. The primary brand being Aztec, which is automotive service technician, it was founded uh, a decade ago with uh, patented technology that allows us to connect uh, factory scan tools in a data center or multiple data centers 
to the vehicle through the cloud as if it was an extension cord from that factory tool. And one of our remote technicians, certified techs, can control the scan or the configuration, coding, programming, calibration, whatever the service is, uh, remotely. Uh, along the lines of those acquisitions, we've acquired companies like Blue Driver, which was uh, really the top selling uh, DIY and DIY Pro uh, scan tool on Amazon, but uh, really had a good core technology group that did things appropriately and created a really robust uh, platform for uh, compressing some of that technology into a smaller footprint, which we wanted to do. Uh, but they also understood the technologies that we had deployed at Aztec, and they were a natural to bring on board to grow uh, our technologies uh, into the future. And then you have uh, companies like uh, Mobile Tech RX and Automobile Technologies, AMT. Uh, those groups were, or OneGuard Inspections, those groups were brought in to help us move into the segments around uh, car reconditioning, uh, auction spaces, uh, uh, inspection spaces for insurance companies, et cetera. Uh, and, and that kind of gets into that one stop, not maybe for Joe's Collision Center down the street or John's Repair Center across the street, but for the industry so that uh, RepairFi is trying to address all the technology needs that the industry sees, no matter where the vehicle lands. So if it lands in a in an auction space, we can do pre-scans before the car goes across the block or after the car goes across the block to serve both the buyer and the seller with adding value to that process. Uh, AMT and and uh, Mobile Tech RX brought software solutions to uh, the gig economy where we've got PDR techs out doing services on vehicles, uh, but they didn't have really good uh, management technologies to manage their business. Uh, so we, we purchased uh, Mobile Tech RX and AMT uh, for a like reason for collision centers, auction uh, businesses to be able to manage those businesses. Uh, so it brings technologies like those together to really allow us to serve where the vehicle is, not necessarily serve everything that one particular business model requires, if that makes sense. Blue Driver, I've got to give a shout out to Morris and Leslie. They hooked me up with a, with a device and I was able to plug <laughs> it into my OBD2 port in my car and diagnose some problems. So. Uh, it was very easy to do. If I could do it, anybody could do yep. it. So I, I remember yep. that. Um, Chris, tell me, in your opinion, what is collision repair's number one diagnostic need right now? Well, I don't think that it's a. There's a silver bullet in the way of technology or uh, something that's going to come along that you can go buy and it's going to magically fix all your problems. Uh, coming from the mechanical industry, having spent 50 years there uh, and really understanding that business model well and understanding the, the technologies that we face today very well, what I see coming across to the collision side is that we need to not think of collision and mechanical, but we need to think of it from the technology or the vehicle. And the car doesn't know where it's at when it's being serviced. It doesn't know what skill level is being applied. It really is a complex machine. In fact, uh, today the vehicles coming off the showroom floor are the most complex machines on the planet. When you consider the, the disparity in uh, and diversity in technologies being kind of mushed together, to accomplish the goal of driving the motorist down the road at speed safely uh, and lasting for many years and performing at a high level. Uh, that means that whatever level the, the motorist that owns the vehicle expects uh, and all the while not costing them anything to maintain it. Uh, you bring technologies and suppliers uh, uh, together and We've got a machine that 
average average vehicle off the showroom floor today has anywhere from 150 to 300 million lines of code on board and the most complex fighter aircraft on the planet has about 25 million lines of code on board so we're we're dealing with very robust technology so we need to recognize that and because it's technology we need to recognize that we can't expect the same skill set and same technician uh, with the same knowledge that we had 20 years ago to be applied in the same way to that technology, that vehicle, and get good results. We have to be thinking about working on technology requires technology companies and technology organizations need to be staffed with technologists and those skilled people need to be fed that skill and updated uh, education on a regular basis along with the tools uh, to be able to service those vehicles or access the information from those vehicles. So we're at a, in my opinion, we're at a crossroads in our industry on both sides of the equation, collision and mechanical, that we really need to rethink how we onboard people to our organization, how we maintain their, their skill sets, how we hire uh, technicians. The number one skill that I see lacking in people in this industry is re it's t reading technical information with purpose. Uh, and that means you need to understand how to find the answers to the questions you're asking about that vehicle, whether it's based on the damage that you're seeing with your eyes on a complex vehicle that has multiple metallurgies and bonding uh, systems applied, or if you're looking at a data network, uh, a neural network, or some or regional networks, which we're going to be seeing soon, software-defined uh, vehicles, you need to be able to read the information with the goal of answering the question you've asked about that system. And today's technicians, and over the last 50 years, have not had to do that. And we've fostered allowing them not doing that, really fostering paying them to guess or to try it or to make mistakes and not be held accountable. And I will tell you the technicians in, in collision shops and mechanical shops are some of the hardest working people and the most well-meaning people on the planet because they want to fix what's wrong. But most of them are what I call unconscious incompetence. They don't know that they don't know. I've been doing this for 30 years. You can't tell me how to paint a car. Well, in today's uh, technology, if you apply the paint incorrectly or you uh, repair a bumper cover incorrectly, the radar signal coming from behind that bumper cover can be distorted and cause the technology to miss a vehicle that's there and cause an impact. That's not good. So what's the most uh, needed technology out there? I think it's uh, all the above, but most uh, most of all, it's education and uh, supporting the people that are working on the vehicles today and understanding that when the car is in a collision center, that it's a mechanical device. It's a technology machine, and you need to have the staff, the technology, the skill, and the equipment to be able to, to service it properly. So Chris, the scan tool and calibration equipment uh, business is, is very crowded, very competitive. There's a lot of players and there's more coming out every day. Um, what makes Repairify stand out? Well, that's, that's a good question. And uh, let me preface that with, this is nothing new. Uh, the industry as a whole, mechanical and collision, especially mechanical, since the onset of the initial scan tools back in the 70s uh, has been uh, filled with the gold standard, which is the factory scan tool, 
not because it was built by the factory or built by the manufacturer, but because the engineers that built the vehicles uh, prescribed a specific way to ask questions of and decipher the answers from the controllers or the computers on board the vehicle. And so they they wrote the standard with which we communicate and talk to and receive information from that vehicle. And the aftermarket has always tried to emulate that. And so over the years, the information from the manufacturer of the factory has been made available to the aftermarket through an organization like the Equipment and Tool Institute, ETI. You can go to etools.org to see all about that. Uh, and ETI is essentially the clearinghouse for the majority of the, of the OEMs to license the data uh, to build a scan tool. It's called scan data. Uh, and it's not software that you plug into your laptop and it all of a sudden becomes a Ford scan tool. It's the information that scan tool manufacturers need to ask the right questions, get the answers and interpret them correctly, and know how to, in, how to ask the controller to do something, a bi-directional control, so that you can see a response. It's the instruction manual of how to, how to talk to the computer and how to interpret that information. And so the aftermarket has either licensed that data over the years or has tried to reverse engineer that data. Now, reverse engineering is very difficult because especially today, it's almost impossible. The vast majority of the manufacturers of scan tools have licenses with the OEMs. And if they don't today, they're rapidly adopting them because they can't start from scratch. It's too complex. It takes too long. It takes too many man hours uh, to reverse engineer. Uh, let alone set aside the, the, you know, the patents and the IP, the copyright, all of that, that needs to be done correctly as well. So with that said, the difference between and an aftermarket tool is typically the factory tool is going to be able to ask questions and read the responses from every controller that's on the vehicle. And in today's uh, in economy and environment, in the collision centers, we want to make sure after collision, can we talk to all the modules on board the vehicle? And are we getting all the information we need to make the appropriate repair plan so that when we deliver the vehicle back to the customer, everything's working and operating as designed? The fallback is the aftermarket tool. And the aftermarket tool has always been believed to never return the same results as the factory tool. And in many cases, that's true. Uh, so in fact, two years ago, we decided to, to answer that question. What's the difference between a factory tool and an aftermarket tool? So we, we started the process called Project Conquest internally where we put technicians out in the field in Copart yards. Uh, Copart has the largest inventory of modern technology vehicles in salvage yards in the planet. Uh, they're an investor of ours. Uh, so we had access. So we sent technicians out using our technology to connect our patented device to our factory scan tools. Along with, in their van, they had all the, the common aftermarket scan tools that you would recognize mm. that are being used in collision centers and mechanical centers across the world. And so we would scan a vehicle using the factory tool, store that report, scan it using scan tool A, scan tool B, scan tool C, et cetera, and compare them in a database, aggregate all that in a database. And we'd, we'd uh, segment it by your make model trim combinations and we have scanned hundreds of thousands of scans on thousands, tens of thousands of vehicles that, actually hundreds of thousands of vehicles, that results in a database that covers 
thousands of your make model trim combinations. And so what we learned is in some cases, scan tool manufacturer Z can scan this Toyota of this model year with this trim package and return exactly the same as the factory tool. But on the same year vehicle with a different trim package, it misses a module. And it's that granular. And so what that gives us the ability to do is, and what segments us, uh, differentiates us in my opinion, is number one, we can always provide the factory scan because our technology is not licensed OEM scan technology on board a device that you plug into the car, but it's actually connecting you to an actual up-to-date current licensed factory scan tool with a OEM certified technician that's connected or operating that tool that's connected to your car and performs that factory scan and provides you with the factory scan report. Or we can provide you with the insights that says on this Camry, our local scan through our device we have validated will work and you can do a local scan. So that gives the, the shop choice it ensures you what through those insights that you're going to get an accurate report and the funny thing about all this is we were you know internally we were thinking oh man we're going to reduce the number of OEM scans that we do on a regular basis on a daily basis because we're giving them permission to do a local scan when it's appropriate well come to find out our OEM scans have grown significantly double digit growth simply because we give them the insights that they trust and they understand that, okay, the aftermarket scan is not going to work on this car. I'm going to use the OEM factory tool scan. And that has been a benefit that we didn't recognize would happen, but I think is a benefit to the industry. Chris, I think repairers are frustrated that there is not one tool that will do it all. Is, is it unreasonable or unrealistic to expect that to ever be the case, that you could have one tool that'll do it all? Unfortunately, in a capitalistic environment, a competitive environment with 30 plus OEMs, uh, globally there's 180 plus OEMs, it'll never happen. I've been, as I mentioned, I've been involved in scan tools since the 70s. I've sat in work groups uh, for both SAE uh, and other organizations as they design standards. Uh, the OEMs can't agree on everything. The one thing they did agree on in the United States is the OBD standards uh, in 1994, which resulted in what we call OBD2, which there was really no OBD2. There was never a standardized OBD1. It was the OEMs kind of developing an onboard diagnostic system in anticipation of what we call OBD2. But it it's really the proprietary information that they they access in the questions that they ask of the system and more importantly the tests that they run on their vehicle which result in diagnostic trouble codes when they fail so uh, because of the proprietary tests that they run on their systems uh, you'll never see those things come together uh, there was hope of that in 1994 we're all thinking great we'll have this onboard system we'll plug in one scan tool and we'll get you know results that mean the same thing on every car we are miles apart, further apart than we were at that point in time uh, we, it'll never come together what we have to have the ability to do is to find ways that are affordable to bring the factory tool technology car side, either through remote access or through licensed software to build a scan tool that performs the functions that are important to the, to the shop or the vehicle in question. And that can be done today. It's just, it takes time, it's expensive. And the way we're building vehicles today, 
we don't take three years or four years or five years to model and test and ideate and remodel uh, before we put it on the showroom floor and sell it. We are building vehicles today that have technologies on board that aren't fully mature enough to turn on that you will soon see turned on through over the air updates or you might get a note in your uh, text message from the manufacturer that says for $9 a month, you can turn on this new feature. And that's going to be the way the industry uh, moves in the near future. But a single scan tool never happened. So don't hold your breath. <laughs> you know, Chris, um, I don't think it's a stretch to say the collision repairs are a little out of their comfort zone with these vehicle okay. electronics and scanning and calibration. Um, they're managing, um, they're getting experience, they're training, um, they have a, a vast amount of tools at their disposal, but there's talk that maybe these cars will calibrate themselves someday, um, which has got to be music to a lot of repairers' ears if that was the case. Um, do you think that someday we'll get to the point where a vehicle will, will calibrate itself or take care of its own internal electri elect electrical problems? without somebody, uh, an outside person having to fix the problem? Well, not unless artificial intelligence totally takes over and, and builds designs and controls everything. Uh, as long as man uh, ideates, engineers, builds, uh, drives, services these vehicles, they'll break. Uh, as long as they break, man will fix them. Uh, I don't see in the very near future, uh, and I'm talking the next 10 to 15 years, that uh, calibrations will go away. In fact, I think you'll see static calibrations grow, especially on the collision side of things, because when the body structure that all those sensors are mounted to uh, is deformed, no matter how closely you follow OE process and procedure and replacing a quarter panel or a, a body panel, uh, it's possible to not place that mounting point in the right position so that the sensor technology can actually dynamically uh, calibrate itself driving down the road. So even if it could, here's the thing that I think uh, scares me the most is that we begin to believe that that's possible, but there's always going to be a gap between when we repair the vehicle and when it becomes, uh, it, when it's put in a ready to crash state, and that's a Chesneyism. Uh, nobody's you know, promoting that marketing statement. But in my opinion, the vehicle's not really ready to drive a motorist by my customer until I've put it in that ready to crash state. And until the system has been calibrated or that sensor is pointed in the right direction and told that everything is ready to go, thrust angle zero, you're pointed in the right direction. I put the target there, I know it's correct. Now go drive the car and gather enough data so that the system can stitch all that data from the other technologies on board and you can feel comfortable that that customer driving down the road is not going to run into something that you missed because of something you missed. It's critical to understand there's a gap. There will always be that gap. Somebody's got to drive the vehicle. It's got to be a tech. It's got to be uh, a technology that puts it in a point where it can calibrate quickly or get it in a place where it can react appropriately as it fine tunes that calibration, but that's not going away. In my opinion, it's probably going to increase over the coming years. You may see static calibrations be compressed space-wise and maybe consolidate some targets. SAE is trying to work on that now. I was on the uh, Emerging Technologies ATIS committee for ACA. Uh, that helped start uh, the work group. But that work group is struggling to get traction uh, with getting the right people in place to get 
the standards process driven. And so it'll probably take three or four years to get that process through. So in the meantime, read and follow service information so that you can calibrate those vehicles appropriately. Well, Chris, uh, I can't thank you enough for being on the podcast today. You know, I get a lot of news from Repairify in my inbox, and uh, I know you guys are on the cutting edge of uh, scanning and calibration technology and diagnostics, so um, I'm very appreciative of your time today. My pleasure. I'm Jason Stahl. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching this episode of Under the Radar. For more episodes, visit BodyShopBusiness.com.